The year is 1954. The crew cuts top the billboard charts with Shaboom. Coca-Cola sells for five cents a bottle. Americans get their first taste of the TV dinner. And Hamilton entrepreneur Ken Sobel opens the city's first and only television station, an institution that will continue for the next 60 years. Life could be a dream, sweetheart. CACH, through Ken Sobel and its various presidents and chief executive officers down the line, uh, was responsible for putting Hamilton on the map. Ken Sobel, well known for his radio amateur show, is general manager of Hamilton's new station. Ken Sobel uh, owned CHML, and CHML, when he took it over, was uh, not a very successful radio station and he built it into a real powerhouse. Hello everyone, well this is the last show of our current series and the long awaited day for our grand prize winners. With the advent of television, uh, Ken Sobel was always the kind of person who was looking for the next big move. It was 1953, so we had a liberal government. Ken Sobel had excellent liberal connections and uh, he was able to get a license uh, when people like Jack Kent Cooke and, uh, and the Bassett family, who were all Tories, were unable to get a license. The old building was an amazing collection of a bunch of buildings. Uh, the main front office, of course, was the, the main house, which Channel 11 still has as its executive offices. Behind that, there was what used to be um, a horse stable, where they kept the carriage and the horses for the original house. But they changed the old stable into a studio. This old house, this was always here. The original new studio was in this building. And uh, there were three houses across the street where there's a big condominium now. I had just started working with the Charrington Show, the Tom Charrington Show. So we were in one house, and next to that was sort of the accounting and administration house. And imagine, it, if you can, and this is before the days of computers, that every night somebody would have to run across the street for the scripts for the newscast and the tapes from the newscast and, you know, bad weather, too bad. You're running across the street for the tapes. And, and the scripts. And there is a classic story of the whole six o'clock newscast blowing down the street one day. Channel 11. When we first started, we didn't sign on till four o'clock in the afternoon. And then we gradually stretched and we'd sign off at midnight. We play the national anthem and show a picture of the queen. And then we put up the test pattern. And the test pattern was an Indian side profile view of an Indian. And we leave this on for an hour so that all the service people could adjust their television sets. Until next Saturday, TTFN. Ta-ta for now. Well, of course, everything was live. Nice to have you with us on the program today, once again at 12 o'clock. It was quite different. There were interview shows for ladies in the afternoon, and there were shows at night for the men with sports. There were children's shows of all kinds. Let's see how good your memory is. There were many cowboy shows. And people used to phone and say they wanted to talk to Roy Rogers, who was a big Western star at that time, and you had to try to tell him he was not there. It was a film we were running. Can you touch your toes? Well, if you can't, I think we might get you down there today. Here comes Saturday Night Jamboree! In the morning, this was delegated as kind of kids' time, and I got involved in that by reading stories. So we had one book, camera here, another one over my shoulder, and the book. So I could say, now look at the book. This is the story of the three bears. You see the bears? Look, this camera would take the picture. There's the mama bear and the daddy bear, and the little, 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 little tiny baby bear. Wait till I show my other friends what I've got. And then we got into puppets. It was Albert J. Steed. He had a terrific following, and his little friend Sebastian. And that consisted of me for three hours, 
talking to my hand. And this was done, again, in this little tiny booth. It required no crew, no anyone. But it was a good way to make programming and did very, very well. This campaign is warming up so fast that I'm only 17 kisses behind Trudeau. <laughs> CHCH played a very significant role in federal politics and provincial politics during the Sobel and Sid Bibby days. Uh, Bibby was a very well connected liberal and so we used to do these live broadcasts and fortunately some of the videotapes still exist where they did live coverage of Pierre Trudeau in 68 coming to Ivor Wind Stadium and uh, in a big open convertible and screaming throngs of people and it's just unbelievable, that the, the imagery. But uh, the station uh, did a lot of political broadcasting, all timed usually at the climax of elections. And uh, many campaigns that the Liberals staged would, would finish with a big rally in Hamilton, which they could always count on uh, Mr. Bibby and Mr. Sobel to, uh, to give them live coverage. Do you have any comment at this time, Mr. Trudeau? <laughs> <laughs> Relax with your TV. Channel 11. It went on the air as a CBC affiliate. When Ken Sobel applied to uh, become an independent station, people were shocked because they assumed that he was going to be a standalone television station. People shook their heads and said, it can't be done. But he, he did it uh, with, a, with a combination of intense local programming, all kinds of homegrown live programming. Presenting the Ken Sobel Amateur Show. Coupled with movies, and it was successful right from the beginning. Nine months each year, the Hamilton Forum is a bustling center of hockey action, home of the Hamilton Red Wings. It's party night here on Channel 11 right through until 9.30 this evening. Everybody, everybody. He broke away, first independent, all on his own. And I'm sure people thought at the time, bad move. We could take money, I think, at that time to the bank in truckloads. When we come back, Hamilton's television station takes on the big guys and makes an offer they can't refuse. Enjoy the wonderful shows on your favorite TV, Channel 11. It's Tiny Talent Time. Here is a show that is big. We started Tiny Talent Time in 1957, and it ran for 35 years until 1992. My one regret in that program was that we never had the luxury of keeping tapes because towards the last five or six years of Tiny, we were in the second generation. Someone who had been on now had brought their child. And I would love to have been able to say, just before you do yours, let me show you another little girl, little boy, who did something and let her see the mother or father. It just worked. It was magic at the time because it was a kinder, gentler, sweeter time. In the early days when we were live, we used to beat NFL football, their telecast, because you had to watch us as we were. You couldn't get us after. So stick with us if you want to see us, and then go to your game, and they did. When I think back to Tiny Talent Time, it was always about just celebrating kids putting on the performance of a lifetime. And some of them were spectacular, and some of them were really cute, and sometimes they were almost bordered on being awkward, but that was the charm of the show. And it wasn't about crowning a winner or uh, you know two kids competing against one another to see who was the best. It was just about celebrating that enthusiasm that kids have when they try really hard to do whatever they do and, and celebrating their performances. And, and I think that's really the spirit behind the new show and why I think audiences are going to love it because it just feels good to watch kids do their best. 
It's party night on Channel 11, and for the first 30 minutes, the Canadian Polka King, Walter Osternack, his band and host, Bob McLean, invite you to Polka Party. Some of the shows originally we did were, were mainly done in the studio because we couldn't go anywhere else, and there was no videotape, so everything was live. Her teeth were like the stars above because they come out every night. One of the favorite memories I have is televising Midnight Mass at uh, Cathedral of Christ the King. We did a, a show for, with Father Meehan. Father Meehan did a half hour show pretty well every, every Sunday. The first color show we did was the uh, DeFasco Male Chorus show. We were involved with the community to a large extent. We did a number of parades. Music was also big in CH's program. Uh, we did Main Street Jamboree and uh, musical variety of different sorts. Ladies and gentlemen, Smith and Smith. Big shows that uh, were produced here in Hamilton by CHCH were shows like Smith and Smith and the Red Green Show, which was well received and well known. Remember, if the women don't find you handsome, they should at least find you handy. We did 20 operas out of Hamilton Place. La Traviata, La Boheme, Carmen, all those. My uncle, Sam Hebsher, uh, was working for the Capitol Theater and the Palace Theater in Hamilton. Ken Sobel, the owner of CHCH, uh, got in touch with my uncle and said, look, you know the movies. Well, I want to run movies on my station. So he hired my uncle, and once he saw that a movie was playing at the drive-in, he would call the distributor and say, I see your movie's playing in the drive-in. Not really in the theaters anymore. Um, we want to buy that. But you don't ask for respect. You don't offer friendship. You don't even think to call me Godfather. The Godfather in 1972-73 was enormous, right? Academy Award winner. At the time, it was the movie to see. And again, you could only really see it at the theaters. It wasn't on television at all. My uncle negotiated a deal with the distributor that he would get that movie before ABC would get to run it on ABC Sunday Night Movie. The ratings were huge. So that was the start of it. CHCH became known as the movie station. The palace was the biggie. I was the voice of the palace, actually, which was kind of cool. Tonight, the palace presents... Jack Jones was the host, uh, a couple of outside producers, uh, but it was all done with our crews and shot in Hamilton Place, which at that time was relatively new. And the biggest of the big stars would come in and do this show, which was a variety show, sort of. And it was done in conjunction with the King of Spain, who sponsored a Spanish version of the same show. Ladies and gentlemen, my good friend, Jerry Lewis. <laughs> oh, it seems your doo-doo did, did to my contact lens. <laughs> I think the, the biggest childhood memory I have uh, had nothing to do with the newsroom. It was Party Game. It's time for television's zaniest half hour, Party Game. I loved Party Game. I loved Dinah Christie, Jack Duffy, uh, Billy Van. I loved the home team. <laughs> they were great. And of course, Bill Walker. And now let's meet our challengers. The feeling of the group involved not only on camera, but the crew around it that kept us so happy, so stable, became our laugh line. And that the blend of people that you saw. I mean, Bill Walker really had that stature and that Billy Van immediately ripped to pieces and Jack Duffy immediately sent up. So there was, he had no, no control really and he would get the giggle sometimes and that was always a familial endearing show, I think. Jack, uh -huh. tell me, what does HQN03 signified to you. Oh, oh wait. Uh, uh, it's right on the tip of my tongue. Well, I suggest you spit it out. It's nitric acid. <laughs> we had done a couple of other shows at, at CH. We had done Party Game, and I saw that, and Supermarket Game Shows. But they had a, a void in their schedule, if you will. They didn't have a great kid show 
at the time. So uh, we pitched, if you'll pardon the expression, uh, a kid's show to Sid Bibby. He thought it was a good idea, but he didn't seem to be 100% sold. We thought it's a horror show. Who would be the, the best star we could bring in, big name star? There were only three major stars in the, in the horror genre, and there was Bela Lugosi, Lon Chaney, and, um, and Vincent Price. So welcome where the sun won't shine to the castle of Count Frightenstein. <laughs> he was a wonderful, warm human being. He was such a nice man. For now we are going to sing Lucy, our national anthem. Yes, yes. But this time we will sing it with gusto. Gusto. No, we can't. He's not here. Oh. He was the show. Billy was the backbone of the hilarious House of Frankenstein. He was the most talented performer I have ever worked with. There was nothing that we asked him to do that he didn't say, sure, I can do that. And then he would expand on the part and, and he grew it ad-libbed at least half of what we gave him to do, albeit it was all written for him. He would just get the idea, oh, I see what you want, and then he would just fly with it. Oh, do you believe in miracles? But that isn't what. <laughs> the big surprise was not its popularity. What shocked all of us was the legs, the fact that it was able to stay on the air for 40 plus years. It ended up being the longest running kids TV show in Canadian history. When next we meet in Frankenstone, don't come alone. When we come back, a first in North America as CHCH expands on its strengths and raises the bar. Well, it's February 11th, soon to be the 12th. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dan McLean, and this is TV 11 Newsroom, Late Edition. We had a half hour at 6 and a half hour at 11, and that was it. We were shooting film and recording our voiceovers on cassettes, cartridges. Connie Smith, TV 11 News in Dundas. There were two female reporters, no female camera operators or anything else. It was a smoky newsroom because everyone smoked except two women. And um, we had a new secretary at that time who poured us coffee. The biggest change when I started, everybody smoked at their desk. You know, there's these giant ashtrays on the desk. That stopped a few years after I was there, but it was just, it was odd that, you know, you think back to it now, there's no way that would ever happen. There will be no more substandard fallout shelters built in Hamilton. Council's Property and License Committee has approved a bylaw aimed at licensing contractors who specialize in fallout shelters. I remember watching our news because we worked different shifts, so writing the 11 o'clock news or the 6 or, or doing stories and thinking, oh, will it ever change? Will we ever do more than a half hour at 6 and a half hour at 11? Now we are going like from 4 in the morning until 7 o'clock at night with news and it's, it's just the, the resources, it's the technology has really, really helped as well because when I started um, in the station, we didn't have even the capabilities really of of a reporter going out to a scene live. I remember when we first got our live trucks and everybody was all nervous. It's like, you know, we, we'd have hours to put together our packages. Now you've got to do something live on this spot. And it, it was a real learning curve for a lot of us. And um, when I started here, we didn't have computers even. Canada's national broadcaster is expected to announce layoffs and other cost cutting actions on Thursday. That's when meetings are being held with all CBC employees. 
microwave technology, uh, cellular technology has come a long way where we have cellular based cameras out there for our remote location broadcasts and the microwave technology has improved so much because our morning show, I mean, we're everywhere. We, uh, you know, whether we're at a store or we're at uh, some news event or wherever things are happening, we've got to be out there simultaneously in different locations. So these uh, leaps forward in technology has been a huge boon, not to CHCH of course, but particularly for Morning Live and all the things we're tasked with. In the 10 years that I've been here, a couple of really major news stories come into mind, and the first has to be the situation in Caledonia, the, the land claim at the Douglas Creek Estates. I was up there for much of those months there. We were up there sort of sub-anchoring newscasts from there, reporting, staying up there, anchoring our newscasts live out there. We've been trying to reach uh, the hot local hydro to find out exactly when that power is going to be coming back on. And watching the situation unfold. <laughs> We begin tonight with new developments on the disappearance of Tim Bosma. Well, I know from talking to Charlene how significant she thinks CHCH was and, and the local media, but CHCH in particular in covering that story. I mean, first of all, it's an abduction. Then it turns into a murder. Then it turns into a very horrific sounding murder in terms of um, at least the way the remains were, Tim's remains were dealt with. I've been covering Niagara since 1985 and the Paul Bernardo, Carla Homolka murder case has to be the worst story and the most compelling story that I've ever done. It was Thursday, the 16th of April at 2.45 p.m. when she left Holy Cross School and headed home. We did a show uh, called The Disappearance of Kristen French. It was a 90-minute show that we, we produced in conjunction with the Green Ribbon Task Force at the time. Uh, and we had uh, FBI profilers in on the show as well. Uh, we had examples of the kind of car that the police were looking for. It was a first of its kind as well. And, and it resulted in some new information coming to the Green Ribbon Task Force. I think we really developed a bond with Doug and Donna after we had done that abduction of Kristen French special. That was done months after Kristen was murdered and before Bernardo and Homolka were identified and arrested. And I think Donna and Doug trusted us. They liked the way we presented Kristen. And they say now, they even tell me now, that we're the only ones that they talk to because they trust us to present Kristen in the way that she was. The one thing that we know has consistently worked well on CHCH is local programming, news programming. You know, there was a time when people would always try to program a station with uh, foreign content, American content, and what eventually transpired is that we realized what really works is local programming, it's news, let's do more of it. We are now watched by about two and a half million people every week, they watch our news programming. So again, we knew going into it that that's what struck the chord with the viewers, news, and so we decided to do more of it. You can expect the price to jump up by another penny. Back to you. All right, more pain at the pumps it seems. Thank you, Melissa. The transition was quick. It was um, almost like flipping a switch to go from what we were doing in the past to doing news all day. We had about one week where we had uh, news programming in the morning that we were doing that we had just added between 9 and noon. And then, then the following week we added uh, the afternoon news programming. So we did it in rapid, quick order. We did hire a lot more people. But the resources, the actual news gathering resources, we're an independent station. We didn't have a network that we were affiliated with. So we were doing all of this kind of on our own. It was an exciting adventure. It was a roller coaster ride. It was a bit uh, scary at times. In the end, everybody pulled together. And that's what I think really proves the success of what we're doing is that everybody in this station was determined that this station was going to survive. We want to encourage people to come down and see all that Niagara offers. We knew that we make a connection with the community in a big way. And uh, so everybody was pulling together to make sure that this new, untried, unproven um, type of programming worked. 
and uh, it's, it's a credit to the people at this station that it has. And right now we do more than 80 hours a week, and that's more than any other conventional over-the-air station in North America. When we come back, from community rinks to Maple Leaf Gardens, CHCH plays a key role in the lives of athletes, young and old. The Sporting Channel, all year round. Your favorite channel for sports, Channel 11. Now, another exclusive TV 11 sports presentation. CHCH had games in the 70s. I think, I'm thinking around the mid-70s. I don't know for how many years, but boy, those years were controversial. Harold Ballard was always blustering. Well, it's too late, and I've been screwed around long enough by those guys, and it's not going to happen any longer. The stuff is out of Hamilton now, and it's resting in Maple Leaf Gardens. Dick Beddoes was egging him on. Has anybody anywhere in Hamilton tried to buy the club from you? No, I haven't had. I'm not going to sell the club. Daryl Sittler, Lanny McDonald, Boreas Salming, those classic games against Montreal. And you could only get two games a week, the Saturday game on CBC Hockey Night in Canada and the midweek game, usually a Wednesday, on CHCH. It was a big, big deal. They drew huge numbers. You knew Wednesday nights. You made no plans whatsoever. You were home and you were watching the Leafs. It was a big event. As this fall, NHL Midweek Hockey joins the CHCH TV system. First uh, Wednesday night hockey started with uh, CF CFTO in Toronto, and uh, there were a lot of stories why it happened. But uh, Harold Ballard, the owner of the Leafs, hated John Bassett. And there was a big falling out, and my boss knew Sid Bibby in Hamilton, and Harold was very close. Harold Ballard was very close to Sid Bibby. They were buddies, so Harold said, "Why don't we put it on Hamilton?" The next thing I knew, uh, I was taken over to the station the old house, and they showed me the mobile that they did junior hockey with. I said, that won't do. They bought a mobile on the spot. It was uh, the best, new, and uh, I approved it. They had the best mobile in Canada. And the Toronto press were shocked, shocked, that Hamilton, who basically showed movies and sitcoms, and were going into the big sports business. The thing that attracted me to their technicians and everything, they've been doing junior hockey for years. They bust right out of the gate the first game. I, I talked to some CBC people, said they're maybe better than we are. Barry Martin down the left side, looking to the middle, set the score! Don Cherry was really getting hot, and he wanted to have, his dream was to have his own bars. And I said, why don't I create a show around a bar? And uh, he named the show The Grapevine. Let's go! <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, here he is, Mr. Don Cherry. We were in the old studio. We were the first show in the brand new building. And then we went to the bars. Everybody wanted to come on because it was shown all over, syndicated, and uh, every hockey player would love to come on. All we'd give them was 500 bucks. You'd never be able to do it now. Tell us about that overtime goal against St. Louis. What, what happened there? Oh, I don't remember that well, Don, but, yeah. but I... <laughs> want me to tell it? I have to tell you a funny story. We had on John Wernick, you know, the, the, the curler, and everybody said he was a good talker and everything, so we had, you know, you got to go 20 minutes, 15 minutes. So every time I asked him a question, he'd say, yep, nope, yep, and I'm trying to think up stories, yep, nope, and Tommy and I held up his side. Only 15 more minutes to go. <laughs> so what do you think of it, fighting the game? They want to get it out. What's going on here? I think it's I think it's great to have it. I agree with having it. I remember one time we had Eric Lindros on, and I'd caught poison ivy. And I had it, and my eyes were all swollen. So I had sunglasses on, you know, acting cool. When I look at it, I still get paid thinking that. Stevie Eiserman was on. Stevie Wonder was on. And the roof was leaking. <laughs> We had to keep going. The water was dripping down on Steve. We had Cliff Thorborn, remember the snooker player? And I, I had a jacket like this on and he had a tuxedo. And I said, well, tell me the difference between pool and, and billiards. And he said, well, Don, let's put it this way. This is billiards and what you're wearing is pool. I want to get to the 72 series right off the bat. We were told by uh, scouts, what's his name, Trechak couldn't stop a balloon. But what they forgot to tell us was the day they scouted him was the night after his wedding. 
Oh. <laughs> well, that does take something out of your life. Right, but yeah. It could, yeah. <laughs> and with the grapevine, that's where I learned that I could go, I could talk, and and I didn't have to have somebody ask me a question. So it was the grapevine that uh, turned me into what I am. I don't know whether that's good or bad, but that it, it was the grapevine that did it, and I'm so proud uh, that I was part of it. Sportsline uh, was a, a well-known property in Ontario for years and um, like a lot of television shows it just uh, kind of went away and when we looked at how talented our, our pool of uh, uh, sports reporters here are and having Mark Hebsher on, on the team uh, who's one of the long-standing original hosts of, of the first Sportsline uh, it seemed obvious that that was a great opportunity that we should tap into Pairing up Mark and, and Bubba as the uh, as the co-anchors of the show uh, was uh, was a nice twist, a new a new uh, feel for it. This is the scene as Channel 11's Norm Marshall meets Eddie Bush, coach of the Hamilton Red Wings. You go back to the early days of this station, and I think it's always been a strong emphasis here: um, amateur sport, uh, high school, college, university, and amateur athletics. And I, I mentioned the. Hamilton Junior Red Wing hockey broadcasts and the late great Norm Marshall was involved in those. People have grown up watching those particular sports events on our station. Owner Ken Sobel and his wife accepted the trophy and handed it over to the team captain, Howie Menard. We localized everything. We could show Blue Jays and all that, so we did all that. But the Toronto stations could do that as well. We were Hamilton, we were St. Catharines, Niagara Falls, Grimsby, Beamsville. Cayuga, that was us. We were their station. One of the most gratifying things for us in CHCA Sports is to introduce a young athlete to our viewing public. And, you know, the young athlete might be a 10 year old or 12 year old or somebody in high school. Millar, who will swim the 200 IM in Auckland, could be the new mighty might of Canadian swimming. At five feet and barely 100 pounds, she's the smallest member of the team. I'm up at five and five o'clock and I leave the house at 5.30 and practice is from six to 7.30 and I get home around eight and I rush to school. <laughs> and to see that person in a few years down the road um, achieve great success and not only for themselves, but in some cases, great success for Canada wearing a Canadian jersey or uniform at an international competition. A few years ago, I was at a Leaf game. A guy came up with his 12-year-old son. He said, Paul, I'm so-and-so. I used to play high school football in Brampton, but I also played quarterback for the Western Mustangs. And I said, yeah, I remember you. Late 80s, you were the third string quarterback. And he said, see, son? He said, tell my son how great an athlete I was. These guys used to watch our games on Saturday on tape delay once the game was over. And they, there was a chugging contest that every time their name was mentioned or their high school was mentioned, they would have to chug a beer. The Oshawa Generals took their first place show on the road tonight, but one of their stars, Dave Andrichuk, was a late scratch. The lanky center watched the game from the stands after learning Scotty Bowman wanted him to report to Buffalo tomorrow morning. When I walk away, I'm going to remember bringing a young athlete into the public spotlight when they were just starting out. We didn't hop on the bandwagon. We were there at the beginning. And they'll thank us for the coverage that we provided. And that's the one thing that I'm going to always remember playing a big role in, in the lives of these young men when they were you know, playing for their university or for the local sports team, and they still remember that, so that's gratifying. When we come back, the cream of the crop. CHCH boasts the best in the business, both in front of and behind the camera. Now, Channel 11 News. Here's Tom Charrington and Dick Beddoes. Good evening, everybody. Mars Carter finally fights back in person. Richard? But can he drive? That's the big question, and you'll talk about that immediately. I am running a newsroom that's got Dick Beddoes. In Hamilton, they've got a team called the Tiger Cats. It's got Norm Marshall. I'll continue with the details of what's going on in just a moment. It's got Tom Charrington. Prime Minister, you're here to try and clean up the Great Lakes. I mean, these, these people were icons. We got Vic Cummings uh, coming in and doing little news breaks uh, during the day. And, and I mean, Vic Cummings was in some ways one of our best known personalities. I mean, his phone never stopped ringing. Hello, Vic Cummings. Are the people of Canada stupid? Have they forgotten the tuna? Have they forgotten the broken promises? No, I
I had the honor of working with Tom Charrington, who was, in my estimation, one of the best. Good afternoon. This is a political affairs program. Tom Charrington um, was exactly the opposite of what most people thought he was in the community. Um, you know, people saw him as this, uh, uh, this, this kind of rude, blustery talk show host who would hang up on people and, and uh, you know, not, not very approachable. Uh, but Tom was, uh, was actually a kitten. You, you don't know, really know what you're talking about. You, you don't know. Tom Charrington was my mentor. I adored him. I watched him on TV with my mom as a teenager on a show called Hotline where women would call up and he'd hang up on them and yell and scream and rant about issues. Lo and behold, I ended up working alongside of him. Found out he was a pussycat, a heart as big as gold. I remember the night that my daughter Kyra was born. I did a weather spot from the nursery holding her in my arms. And Tom Charrington, who had this very gruff personality, came to me the next day. I watched when you, you showed your daughter on the news last night. I wept, <laughs> you know, in that very deep voice of his. And I mean, he was really, you know, a teddy bear. Good evening, this just in. Norm Marshall, of course, legendary. He was the first voice of CFL, and he did all those original first group of Grey Cup games and all that kind of stuff. And of course, uh, did the newscast for the longest period of time up until 81. And that's when I joined the news team. What we got here, we got some football. Oh yeah, football. Well, I don't know what this football is all about. It should be hockey, it should be hockey, guys. Dick was without question the most flamboyant broadcaster that ever was on CH. I mean, some of the stuff he did was absolutely outrageous. Hamilton has the worst slow pitch league anywhere on this planet. And of course, the CHCH dead wires therefore are in it. He called me at 20 after midnight to say you had had the job and I sort of yelled out an expletive because I thought it was one of my colleagues playing a joke on me. He said, listen kid, if you don't want the job, I'll just hang up. And I said, is it really you? And he said, yes, it's me. And he hired me for $35 a broadcast and uh, I, I was thrilled beyond belief. Beddoes was always fun, unpredictable as hell, but he was always fun. <laughs> His writing was just beyond, beyond belief. And we hope to make this thing exciting, lively with verve, acerbic overtones, and most of all in the playpen of sports as realistic as games can be. Dick's reputation was uh, forged and established in print media. He was a well-respected journalist in this country. And so if you worked for Dick, you really had to do a thorough journalistic job. Uh, Dick was a colorful, brash individual. If you look at Don Cherry nowadays, Don Cherry's wardrobe, I mean, he may as well have taken some of that right out of Dick Beddoe's uh, tickle trunk. We used to do a talk show and they said, what do you do with all your old clothes? I said, I give them to Dick Beddoe's. <laughs> and the hat, remember? He was terrific. I kid you not. Was it tough working with Matt? <laughs> I'll say no, no, actually it, it isn't. Matt is goofy and always has been. And initially we shared a desk when I first started here because there weren't enough in the newsroom. And so I shared a desk with Matt. He, he cleared out a drawer for me, it was great. What makes CHCH so special is the people. And in this building, levels are so high, the asbestos is airborne. Here, tonight at 7.30. There's a great history here of very, very successful and engaging people on camera. But the strike hasn't had much of an impact on the dealerships. It can be sustained through a usually slow winter season. Thank you, Jim and Alexis. All right. And there are also the people who are behind the camera. Hey, Taz, so we're going to go to question period right now. They were excellent at their job. And what's almost as important as, as their their talent or their expertise at their job was attitude. And they were devoid of attitude. Everybody at CHCH, everybody did everything, and everybody did whatever you asked, even if it was outside the box. I mean, I remember when we were doing the, um, the Wolfman episode. I am the Wolfman. We wanted to come up with an interesting effect and we were just fooling around and we said, let's do this and let's do that. And I think one of, one of the guys helped come up with the idea where we shot the monitor with the camera and we kept getting feedback and, and distortion and all those things. And a lot of people 
in the big time. We would have said, we're not gonna waste two hours so you can figure out how to make distortion. You know, go do that on your own time. The CHCH guys were all terrific. It's part of the $5.2 billion 12-year exclusive deal with the National Hockey League that was negotiated last November. They're the people who care about the station. It's their station. And that kind of a sense of ownership that has made this station so successful over the years. When we come back, on the verge of shutting down, CHCH takes a chance and lays the foundation for the next 60 years. This is CHCH News at 6. CHCH sold. Who's the buyer and what the deal means to viewers? All news all day. We never ever envisioned CHCH becoming available. And it was one day that we saw a press release from Canon West Global at the time saying that they were putting up the e-channels up for sale. And we, that's when the idea of hatched of, okay, how do we buy CHCH? After months of uncertainty about its future, including threats of closure, Ken West Global has announced that CHCH has been sold. One of the primary things that appealed to us was simply the ratings. Um, other people looked at you know, the financial performance only. They looked at its proximity to Toronto only. Um, we looked at the ratings and what we saw was that when CHCH was in live news, the ratings were high. When they went to foreign or acquired programming, the ratings would drop. Essentially, we said, well, why wouldn't you do more of what works and less of what doesn't? And could you model that into a, a business that makes sense? And so we did. And coming up on five years ago, we went to an all-news, all-day format that's really worked for us. When you're a big conglomerate, um, CHH was an asset of many uh, dozens of other assets that they have. So they really didn't have the attention. Uh, so sort of paid to it the way it should have been. And when we looked at CHCH, we saw a great core of people working there. And it was just a matter of now just sort of pointing them in a certain direction, saying, go for it, and then standing back. Because a lot of people said, well, you guys made you know, some great uh, strides there. We said, not really. It was the same people. We added actually more people. But it was the talent and the sort of uh, the expertise of the people that got you know, the station back on track. Zoom 2, dissolve QTAS. Television's going through some changes right now, and, but you know, it's been going through changes forever. Um, touched on Ken Sobel, I mean, if you think back, um, he founded an independent, uh, at the time an affiliate of CBC, but an independent television station, and broke away from CBC to make it really independent. And in some ways, we've, we've continued that particular you know, part of the vision. When there was a transfer of ownership, and we were darn, darn, darn close to having a closed sign, on CHCH and uh, a lot of people in the industry um, had written us off and uh, everyone just ramped up. We knew what we were doing works. We just needed the support. We got that support. We pulled it together. We put it on TV and it's been huge and we proved everybody wrong and we do it every day. I'm so proud of that. And it's fair to say it's good news for local news. I don't know where we're going to be in 60 years. That's, that's, a, that's a long way off. And I don't know if even the people who started the station 60 years ago had a sense of where we'd be now. But we're going to be here 60 years from now, whether it's more on your tablet, whether it's more on your computer, your smartphone, whatever new devices come out. CHH is going to be around. CHH is going to be credible. And it's going to be relevant. And it's going to be where people turn to get their news in this region.